of Humanities, Session 2. Uh, so you, uh, you'll you know from what you've seen on Osler that this is going to be a two-part event. It's going to start with uh, a, a half hour with uh, Alan Bloom, whom I'll introduce in a moment, uh, as well as uh, a panel discussion uh, uh, featuring uh, five uh, caregivers from quite different backgrounds uh, that uh, will talk about their experiences uh, with, uh, with Health Humanities and, and the Arts. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody for, for coming back. Uh, so uh, Alan Bloom uh, is a family physician uh, from Tuscaloosa in Alabama. One of the uh, advantages, uh, you, you, some of you may say, uh, one of the few advantages of Zoom uh, is that we are able to uh, get folks uh, that are expert from around the world uh, to, uh, to join us in, uh, in real time. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to uh, have Alan here uh, in, that, uh, in that fashion. He actually has some Canadian connections and is proudly, I would say, semi-Canadian. <laughs> he might uh, increase that even beyond 50% in some ways. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let him describe just how, he's, uh, how, how that relation has, uh, has been. Um, he's uh, uh, going to be speaking about uh, taking uh, patient histories. Uh, taking patient histories is one of the uh, 278 skills that you're going to be learning in medical school. Uh, and one of, the, one of the thrills that you may find about medical school and your subsequent careers is that there, uh, there are so many ways of enacting those uh, and using those, those skills. And you'll find that as you see different uh, preceptors uh, talking about how they how they do what they do and uh, when you listen to your colleagues and, and watch your colleagues doing things you'll find amazing ways of doing things. I hope that uh, your experience with Alan today will show you uh, a really extreme way of, uh, of taking patient histories that's unique and I think uh, extraordinary compelling. Uh, so uh, one other thing to mention is that uh, Alan is actually the international representative. I think we may have mentioned that briefly uh, at the last session. The international representative on the Canadian Association for Health Humanities, uh, uh, where, it, where uh, I met him and uh, am pleased to say that uh, I enjoy working with him. So Alan, I'll uh, pass it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. It's a, it's a great honor. I appreciate it. And uh, if you don't know Tom personally, I hope you'll get to know him. He's, he's been recognized throughout Canada and, of course, is the founding president of the Canadian Association for Health Humanities. I would love to have been a student uh, and joining this organization. We didn't have anything quite like it. I had a great poet, uh, John Stone, as my advisor, so that sort of took half credit. But uh, this is a marvelous organization. I hope you also subscribe to the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which I understand comes to you free. And Barbara Siebold has a wonderful section in the humanities in that journal. There's also a weekly publication you can get for free called Pulse Voices or pulsevoices.org that's simply wonderful. Uh, and something called Hectoen, H-E-K-T-O-E-N, Hectoen International, is an online quarterly that's really, really exciting to read. Uh, I think the Calgary tradition is best exemplified by Tom, uh, who did a paper last year on E.P. Scarlett, who was the renowned editor of the uh, historical bulletin of the Calgary Associate Clinics. And uh, I, I hope you get a chance to learn more about E.P. Scarlett during your education in Calgary. You know, it, it's, it's such an honor. To, and I remember my first day in medical school, we, we actually had a case. Uh, they presented a case to us of... of Tetralogy of Fellow, but I quickly learned about vocabulary and, and maybe to stop referring to people as cases. And, and uh, that was perhaps one of the greatest gifts that Emory gave me, uh, is being very careful with my language and understanding and above all listening. Because believe it or not, 
and this is no trigger warning, um, there is less of a gap between you in your first week of medical school uh, and me. I graduated along with uh, Dr. Rosenhal in 1975. Um, then there is between you and your last day of college, because you'll go home Thanksgiving and you're already going to be asked about medical questions. But it's really that role of doctor or teacher. That's what doctor means. It means teacher, or educator, or leader. And it doesn't mean proceduralist. It doesn't mean the prescriber. It does mean a teaching. And we all learn from each other. So I hope to learn from you today as well. Listening is the key and also language. Don't hide behind medical jargon. Don't ever say erythematous when you mean red. So many better ways to use the word red. Try never, and I know this is really anathema, uh, to use the term chief complaint. What a negative. Uh, I, I try to dig for the chief concern or for the patient's personal concerns. Complaint is a negative. And the patient is never a poor historian. You are the historian. You're taking the history, not the patient who's scared enough just being there. There's also a single history. It's not uh, a family history, a, an occupational history, a social history. Social history is history. What percentage do you think you learn about the patient uh, with history, with physical exam and laboratory testing. Think about that for a second. The, the studies that have been done suggest that 85 to 90% of what we know about a patient comes from history. And you can divide up the rest with all that fancy laboratory stuff and our physical examination. You can't do it alone with history, but you've got to look at the proportion of what we learn. So, I hope by presenting these patients a little differently than you perhaps are going to see, you'll, you'll, you'll remember back to the way in which I, beginning in medical school at Emory, uh, began jotting down my patient's stories and, and listening. Tell me a story. I, I think that's one of the most endearing and tender requests. And as a family doctor, I'm blessed to care for patients who tell me their stories. Each of us in healthcare is constantly honing our story listening and story facilitating skills. So today I'd like to share with you some of my patient's stories and the mix of emotions they inspire. Each story is accompanied by a vignette or a moment or a sketch. And I began doing this uh, when I started going on the clinical wards in medical school. I'd sit in the outpatient waiting areas and strike up conversations. And with a patient's permission, I'd spend a few minutes sketching him or her and jotting down our dialogue. My medium was simple, black ballpoint pen and whatever paper was handy, prescription blanks, paper towels, or notepads with ads for aldactazide or, or Actifed. We're so accustomed to the bustle, excitement, and challenge of a hospital that it's hard to imagine the stillness, solemnity, and fear found in the waiting room. Among nearly 5,000 patients I've sketched, there have been few smiles. There is, as one woman described it, much worryation. To me, a, a sketch provides the necessary balance to the computer-based radiologic images we now count on to tell us what we believe a patient really looks like. The sketches bring back the essence of an individual encounter. Each face surrounded by jotted notes recalls a detail of personality, a conversation, and an illness. So I'll share the screen now with uh, my um, uh, presentation, Seeing Patients' Compassion and the Art of Medicine and tell you a bit about, whoop, let's see if I can, uh, I'm not being able to control my, we, we rehearsed this many, many times, right? Now yes. I can't seem to advance my slides. Ah, here we go. Okay. My father, uh, that was, Leon Blum was his name. He loved the practice of medicine from the 7 a.m. hospital rounds to the after supper house calls. His office was in our home in Rockaway Beach, New York, where every afternoon the living room became the waiting room. His favorite day was Monday, when he could start the week anew, seeing patients in the very place he'd been raised, Rockaway Beach, New York, home of Jonas Salk and Burl Crohn, Crohn's disease. But it wasn't just his knowledge, his clinical skill, his compassion, or his love of medicine that most endeared him to patients. Rather, it was his way of speaking, down to earth, sprinkled with humor, listening closely, making small talk, asking questions that showed he cared. Where are you from? Who's at home? What do you do? What do you like doing? He never lost sight of the patient's world beyond the examining room. 
he was a kind of environmentalist. He learned the nuances of the ever-changing neighborhoods, picking up on slang and dialect, or teaching himself Spanish for his Puerto Rican patients. I remember coming home one night and hearing him rehearsing the same phrase over and over again. I said, Dad, what, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching my, my, my patients to please pee in the bottle, please pee in the bottle. I think that uh, he, he knew that, that uh, uh, learning about patients meant learning from them in their environment. He'd stop to talk with a hospital handyman, the priest or the policeman. And, and I think he knew the essence of undoing the technology and demedicalizing things long enough to get to know the patient. So let's sit today for the next 25 minutes and gaze and prolong the encounter. And let's keep our eyes and ears wide open and be aware of their concerns, aging, anxiety, technology, what patients think of it what, and how we rely on it perhaps too much, sexuality, dieting, AIDS, death. And here was his letter from uh, when he was accepted for his internship and notice his compensation was $50 a month in full maintenance. You'll have to furnish your own uniforms. I couldn't resist overlaying my letter when I was accepted at the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, in 1975 for my internship in internal medicine. And there I began what I call my McGill Diaries, um, sort of collections of uh, uh, newspaper clippings and notes and little sketches of patients that uh, I, I would come back in every day and sort of paste into a notebook. Um, these are just some examples of these and uh, I kept these for, for quite a few years, and um, since then, I've basically just done things randomly or one at a time, but never in, in as organized a diary or chaotic, chaotic a diary as this. And this was one of the early groups of patients that I put together from my waiting room stints and that I submitted to the Journal of the American Medical Association. So that was my first public uh, work in this field of portraiture in clinical medicine. The current issue of AMA Ethics Journal has an entire feature on the artist Mark Gilbert, who has painted portraits of patients with cancer and other diseases, and he gets to know them and talk with them as well. So he and I constantly are looking at ways that we can influence others to look at portraiture and portrayal in clinical medicine. And here was a, a sketch that uh, I did of Wilder Penfield, who was considered Canada's foremost physician. And I had the opportunity as an intern to hear, uh, to meet him. I, I'd actually wanted to meet him and I, I went to the neurosurgical suite and even watched an operation, but I never was able to get to meet him until I heard that he was in the hospital. And one night after coming off call, I went to his hospital room and knocked on the door and he welcomed me. And as I sat there for the first time in my life, perhaps without a pen, I tried to remember everything we spoke of and I quickly went out after the hour and I wrote it all down. And many years later, I came across those notes and I wrote this up for the Canadian Medical Association Journal for their 100th anniversary and got through, through this, got to meet his family and spend time in a Lake Memphremagog with his daughter, his granddaughter, and uh, really enjoyed uh, getting to know them. And that sketch took me uh, perhaps the longest of any sketch I've ever done. It, it was done from a photograph um, and I went through 50 versions of that. But this was a patient in Montreal. I remember him because I wrote down in the, in the margin, I fought Griffin. He was a, a, a heavy, he was a middleweight and he, he was a fighter and he was uh, constantly having his problems and showing up in the emergency room. And he would take his, his, his fist and slam his head like this and tell me about the metal plate that they had to put in his head from all the trauma that he'd sustained and all the operations he'd had on his skull. I came in early today because I had this weird psychic feeling you were running on time. That's what this young lady told me. And she said, they had my mother in hospice for a year, but she wasn't terminal enough, so they terminated her. I like older doctors. They seem to talk to you more, just like you talking. Younger doctors seem to be in such a hurry. I had one doctor used to have to chase him, grab onto his white coat, flitting up and down the hall. You want to ask him something, you have to run him down. I don't sketch children too much because they move around a little quickly, but uh, I always ask kids the question, what do you do for a living? And, you know, usually it's, oh, I live in my house and play, or uh, my job is to take care of my toys. Um, 
But one time I had this little, this is a six year old girl. I said, what do you do for a living? She says, doctor, I am a child. Uh, a lot of times I'll say, are you in college? One child said, I'm still four, but I'm fixing to be five in one more year and I can play t-ball. One child asked me, are you the principal? And another said, I see you've been going to church, you know, when I come in with a tie. Here is a lady who was 96 when I sketched her, and I asked for the secret of her long life. And she thought a minute, and then she said, I tended a cow, and I'd be out in the opens a lot, mm, was named Molly. And then she added, my friends are all years younger than me, but I think I am still younger than they are. On the other hand, this lady said, there are not many advantages to being from Laredo, Texas. What can you do for my age? It'd be better if we could just evaporate. We all might elect to evaporate a little bit sooner. I don't know whoever invented old age, but I'm against it. And this poor lady said to me, I'm older than I look because I worried myself to death all my life. And she said, this elegant lady, that doctor I saw didn't know nothing about polio. Said it just weren't her generation to know nothing about it. I can't remember that doctor's name as many bills as I got from her. And I often uh, make house calls, uh, not recently, uh, obviously with our pandemic, but uh, throughout uh, my residency, I would try to visit patients. And uh, one thing I learned from my chairman, Dr. Lynn Carmichael, who founded the first family medicine program in North America, that you always wanna excuse yourself and go to the bathroom and wash your hands and you open up the medicine cabinet. And sure enough, I did this with this patient and I saw exactly why we hadn't been keeping any of his problems under control because there were all his medicines lined up in alphabetical order or chronological order in his medicine chest, just un unopened, unfilled. But then, you know, I asked him about this and I, 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 I think he appreciated me uh, because he, he, um, he said, you know, you've done good, doctor. It's the first time a doctor ever broke it down where even a good old country boy can understand. Because the first time I'd met him, he said, whoa, whoa, you got to talk to me like you're not in school. See, my other doctor didn't explain, he said. I had to go through the grapevine. He didn't explain. All he did was give me a lecture. Oh, my blood pressure. Oh, my blood pressure. Well, I'm not a doctor. I mean, you have to explain. You have to draw me a picture and color. And here was a patient from Montreal who was very, very scared. He, he came into the hospital, never been in the hospital in his life. He was 78 years old. And he had the, the sheets pulled over his eyes. He was so frightened. And I made the mistake of, of he needed a hematological consult of not realizing that the hematologist that we consulted had just arrived from Australia. So keep that in mind as you consider his accent. And I swear to you, he came into the room and here's this man, he's got the sheets right up his eyes, scared out of his mind. And the wonderful, friendly Australian hematologist comes bounding into the room and says, hello, did you come into the hospital to die? And he's, he's just, he said, well, what do you mean die? Is it, oh, and then the Australian hematologist realizes, oh, no, not, not to, to die. I mean, yes to die. The day, you know, he tried to cover for that. But when he got better, he came back to visit me. And uh, he was a very sweet man. And he would say things like, I bought a juicer. I eat plenty of juice, only I put vodka in. And sometimes when you got a cold, you take a drink to go to sleep. But when you wake up, you got a cold and a hangover both. One time I asked him, can I take your blood pressure? And he said, are you going to give it back? I'm feeling old, this lady said. Ain't like my mother. She and I was walking one time and somebody said we look like sisters. Well, a compliment to her maybe, but not to me. Her name was Lester. And I asked her, how did a woman get the name Lester? She said, well, my mother and my father picked out a girl's name and a boy's name. My identical twin sister, Virginia, got the girl's name. And here was a lady, well, actually, this is a, a mother-daughter. I never could quite figure out who was who. Um, and here was a lady who wouldn't leave our hospital until she had what they used to call a nuclear magnetic resonance image. We've changed it to magnetic resonance image because we didn't like that word nuclear, too scary. And uh, I finally relented, knowing that we could then get her out. But I got a page immediately that she had disrupted the whole radiologic suite and demanded that the test be stopped and she needed to go home immediately. So I was elected to go down and talk to her in the radiology suite. And here's what she said. I had an old cousin. When I came on the ship to New York, he said, I want to take you to Howe Caverns. But when we got there, 
He only bought one ticket. I asked why. He said, you're not taking me underground. I'd be going there soon. And that stayed with me. No underground trips. So when they put me in that tunnel to do that test, I got so scared. I started to say the Lord's Prayer. I asked God to forgive me for things. And I told him to stop the test. So doctors, when you're planning trips, don't take old people underground. And sure enough, when I took my son on a trip of colleges the very next summer, we passed, we drove right by in upstate New York, How Caverns. So we went in and sure enough, with all that crazy lighting, it's a spooky place. This is a, a former dean of Emory University School of Medicine. He was the dean in the 1950s and I had the chance to meet him when I applied to medical school in the 70s. And he became a geriatrician and was still practicing well into his 80s. My mother worked with him actually when she was a laboratory technician. And I asked Dr. Uh, Wood, uh, Dr. Hugh Wood, uh, one time when we were just shooting the breeze, how he knew he was going to be a good doctor. He was the first medical intern, the first Harvard trained medical intern uh, at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. And uh, I asked him, you know, when did you know that you were really going to be as good as you are and, and be a good doctor? And here's what he told me. I worked for a summer with Dr. Martin L. Dalton. It was the end of my junior year in medical school at the Medical College of Virginia. I'd like to tell you about one house call we made. Now here was a man, his wife and his little girl all sick with a fever in August. Dr. Dalton took the tongue temperatures, felt the pulse, pulled off his coat, rolled up his sleeves and said, you all got typhoid fever here. Well, we gave an enema to one that was distended and did some things that he gave instructions to do. And we inquired who in the neighborhood had had typhoid and wasn't afraid of it, who could come and look after them. Then we drove another couple of miles and got a neighbor to come minister to these three sick people. Going back home in the Model T, I got the courage to ask, how'd you know so quick they all had typhoid fever? Well, he laughed at me for a mile or two, and then he said, I suppose you want the Weedall test uh, to detect typhoid bacilli in the blood and the blood culture and the stool culture. I answered yes, because those were the things I thought you had to have to know about typhoid. But he said, it, it, it's a typhoid house. No screens on the windows, flies all over the place, pigsty above the spring so it could wash into it. It's just a typhoid house. Oh, bring your tube when we come back to see him next week and get your specimens. I did, and that Weedall test was positive. And, and years later, when I interviewed Dr. Wood formally for an article I was writing uh, after I graduated from medical school, I, I, he, he told me how concerned he was about the overemphasis on technology and forgetting the patient. The patient will tell you what's the matter with him if you know how to listen. Not always, but frequently, he said. The thing that makes a good doctor, he told me, doesn't come out of a medical school or a hospital. You know where it comes from? His home and his early environment, maybe his pastor, somebody he loves and trusts, somebody who is confident he'll be worthwhile. And here's one of those people that we, we, we hope won't mind the technology, but we had to send this man for cardiac catheterization. And here's what he told me about the procedure. Lying on that table, scared, bothered me more than the procedure. That board they had me on looked like a cross. Then they hogtied me, when the heart doctors were ready like paratroopers to come in. That's about as scary a way to figure it. Or this gentleman. Well, let me tell you a little story. I had a little pain in my chest. Yeah, I don't know whether it was gas pain or not. So the doctor took one of those electro things with all the wires and he said, well, it looked good, but I need more tests. So he sent me for an x-ray like a movie and he looked at my heart and said, it okay, but I'm not too satisfied. I wanna hear it. So he took me in a room and listened with a microphone and says, well, I'm not too satisfied. And he went and stuck a wire up my leg on TV. I could see the wire in my heart poking this way and that way. Oh, it's all right, he says, but I'm not too satisfied. So he sent me running on that moving sidewalk and more tests and down the line somewhere. He said, well, you're all right, but here, take this medicine anyway. Or this lady saying, scared out of her mind um, for a little minor surgical procedure. We're just going to sew up a laceration. She said, you better just go ahead and do it now because I am mentally prepared for you all to kill me today. Another lady told me what a mammogram was like. She says, you know what that's like? Put your boob on the driveway and tell your boyfriend to back his pickup truck over it. I don't know if it was the same lady, but another one said they operated on my knee and trimmed my hibiscus. 
This lady said it ain't too much fun to go to Weight Watchers and get up on that scale and see that you have paid to gain weight. It's okay, she said, until you're around people eating normal food, like at a barbecue and you're eating protein bars. Weight is a lot of, lot of what we do. I had a lady that said, I figured it out. I'm 329 pounds and at my weight, I should be eight foot seven inches tall. So I'm not fat, I'm short. Of course, one time I asked a lady, how'd you lose the weight? And she simply put her head down and said, well, I lost my dad. Or this man, I asked how he'd like that no salt diet. I foolishly put him on. He said, well, glared at me. He said, well, sort of takes the sting out of the dying. I told this lady, we're going to give you a medication that we think can stop your seizures. She said, I don't know why. It's the only exercise I get. She was pretty sassy. I said, any problems at home? She said, no, just the usual shit with my kids. One's a dope head, the other's 17. After a new patient in the clinic told me he was disabled from a stroke he'd had eight years before, I asked him what he did before the stroke. Oh, I did a little bit of everything, he said. A little bit of cocaine, a little bit of marijuana, a little bit of whiskey. And this very feisty 93-year-old woman always would come in in a wheelchair with her 58-year-old son pushing it, and she was always bickering in the waiting room. We had to constantly bring them into the exam room because they were making such a fuss. And her first words on every visit were, I think I'm dying, doctor. And finally, I said, why do you always say you think you're dying? And she turns, she says, well, to please him for one thing. We see a lot of grief. And if we don't pick up on it, we miss the source of, of, of a lot of depression, the anniversary reactions. Uh, almost every week we pick up on things that we're not even in the history. I've known people for three or four years without knowing the trauma in their life that caused their depression. And this woman had an anencephalic baby, and she was yet the most unbelievably grateful person I think I've ever met. And she told me about her experience, a baby without a brain, who they wanted to terminate, but no, she insisted on carrying it to term. And here's why. He lived 12 minutes. I wanted him to, be, to live long enough to be born, to let his four grandparents hold him. And when it came time to die, he would die in my arms. The Lord granted us all three of those things. We see a lot of isolation. Pictures of, of people, many, this woman never even spoke English. She was from Russia. We couldn't communicate with her. But there's a, a, a calmness, but also an isolation behind masks and uh, ventilators. This was almost an unrecognizable person I sketched in an operating room. The fear. And this man in an ICU, having been in a, a, a very bad way, we tried to convince the, the, uh, the wife to let him go, but she wouldn't. And she stayed by his bedside every day. And I finally asked her to tell me more. And this is what she said. When he had his automobile accident, 29 years ago in Louisiana, 15 inches of plastic aorta, punctured lung and all that stuff, the Lord performed three miracles. He lived, he was able to walk, he went back to work. I'll be there. I've been there 48 years. And, you know, there she was. I, I took care of a lot of patients who are homeless. And, you know, almost every time you see an area of woods in the city of Houston, whether it's a traffic island or wherever, there are people living there. And I would go out and make some home visits. And I met a Berkeley graduate, one of the greatest universities in the United States, a banker, a sister, a man whose sister was a physician in the very medical center in which I practiced a gospel singer who'd won a regional audition to appear nationally on Star Search, but spent his airline money on drugs, a former nurse at the big hospital who helped train doctors and found herself homeless at 61. I'm in the homeless field, she said. It's a lot harder job than I was doing before. But I had a wonderful patient named Carrie, and, and I recognized something about him. He, I had just seen Forrest Gump, and I was convinced that this is who he really was, because unlike all the other homeless people I'd ever met and cared for, he was as sweet and innocent and absolutely not streetwise, as you can imagine. He'd somehow survived. He wouldn't go to the shelters. And, and I asked him once, where did you grow up? He said, well, uh, my parents sent me to the state school when I was nine to teach me to dress myself and balance my checkbook. And I said, what else did you learn? He said, well, I learned to teach myself to read. I said, how'd you do that? He said, Sesame Street and Vanna White. And I said, really, can you write? He said, oh, I taught myself to write, so I write pretty good. I said, really? He says, yeah, they say I write just like a doctor. But he sold his blood, 
and he got a check. And every month he would use that check not to go to the shelters, but to buy tickets to the Houston Opera or the Houston Ballet because he loved to watch the stories. And we got him a little job. And the next Christmas he came to give me this calendar of uh, ballet dancers by Degas. We also treat a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease. A lady with Alzheimer's disease whose daughter said, it's just like another child that I have to childproof the house for. Or, uh, do you know where you are? Oh, I think I'm right here. Or, did you swallow your pill? Oh yeah, I heard it hit bottom. Uh, it's, it's just a, a kind of wonderful innocence. A lady who cares for patients with Alzheimer's said to me, if they have a worried look, you just smile. You respond to their faces and the tone of their voice. You just try to put them at ease. And, and we see them in their expressions. Or patients with AIDS. Here's Hector's mother commenting on Hector's AIDS. He cleaned a birdcage and he wore out. He's so outcasted and alone. Actually, he didn't really tell me he gave me a pamphlet. When in my mind, I felt something all the time, something wrong with him. When he came home sick from New York, doctors wouldn't tell me anything. Doctors say, he'll have to tell you. And here's another woman also dying of AIDS when we had very little to treat with. But as we move toward uh, the end, I wanted to share to you a story of this woman who was uh, actually from Uganda. I was in the emergency room Sunday morning. She said, my, my nerves boil, my head about to blow up. They told me it was anxiety and gave me pills. I don't want pills for stress. I want my husband to say good things to me. I want to be loved. At home, at dinner, he sits there. He's very quiet. He has his hands on his lap. So last night I said to him, can you use your hands to do other than sit on your lap? Put them around me. I want to feel it. If you make me feel it, I can be healed. Sweetheart, you can heal me. I don't need any pills. You all I have and I'm all you have. I said to my husband, relax my head and talk to me. What should I say? Oh, put something sweet in my head that I can go with to bed. And he did. And I slept very well. And this wonderful man said to me, doctor told me I needed an autopsy, but I, I said I wanted to wait. And lastly, you made me feel better, doctor. Let me tell you all about my life. May the good Lord take a liking to you, but not too soon. Thank you, Alan, for that uh extraordinary performance. Well, we have a moment for critique or comment, maybe. Uh, I'm, yeah, just uh, getting lots of, uh, lots of uh, thank yous with exclamation marks. Comments like stunning work and brilliant. I didn't share you the story of a lady who told me her hip was hurting so bad that if she could just put a little WD-40 in it, it'd be okay. And sure enough, the next week I came across this headline, WD-40 sprays away pain, you know. Did you lose me or? I, I just lost my screen for the moment. Mm -hmm. I've got you back. Thank you. Uh, let me just... Uh, Uh, control my screen here. Just something from uh, from Craig Scott. Thank you for these wonderfully humanizing stories. Your comment about apparatuses creating a challenge to seeing someone hit home with my previous disability work. A comment from that experience was, quote, I wish people would see me, not my disability. Do you have any tips for balancing medical attentiveness and the humanistic seeing of people? Well, I think the term is differing ability, and it's an interest and a passion of mine. I happen to be fortunate to have a college classmate who helped um, uh, establish the Americans with Disabilities Act, and uh, he uh, and Lex Frieden 
who is a, uh, a professor at the University of Texas, um, are just the most amazing people. Um, I became interested in, uh, dis in, in differing abilities when I met Dr. Howard Rusk, who um, is considered one of the modern founders of the field. He was assigned in World War II to work in a, in a hospital where a lot of the, 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 the people were wounded pretty terribly, and they were paraplegic or quadriplegic. And he noticed, though, that uh, they were uh, throwing paper planes across the room, and he came up with the idea to train them to identify enemy aircraft. And he got many of these people in wheelchairs even back up to become spotters of aircraft. And uh, that's considered one of the earliest uses of rehabilitation. Um, and um, uh, I donated my collection of articles on the personal experience of disability to the Texas Institute of Rehabilitation and Research. And they have digitized it. And I'm still collecting these stories. Uh, they're for patients and for faculty and for students and I'll be happy to send the link to the Texas Institute of Rehabilitation and Research, which has the personal experience of disability. Um, I, don't, I think we all have disabilities, and, and, but we would rather say we all have differing abilities. Thanks, Ellen. I know that we're, uh, we're at the end of our time. Uh, could I get you to ask Kevin to type the link into the chat box? And that'll get to, is Kevin still with you? Yes, I can, I'll go look it up and send it while I'm, I'm uh, okay. tuned as well. I hope uh, to see you at the end and maybe. Uh, I was, yes, I was going to say that you're going to stick around to the end. I so sure if people like have more questions, questions, they'll have an opportunity to ask those as well. We'll and give them the quiz at the end, right? That they have to pass in order to. <laughs> right. It's on the exam, exactly. Okay. Just want to make sure. Uh, the other thing uh, Alan suggested to me before this was that if anyone wanted to uh, continue a conversation with him, uh, he's happy to share his email and uh, you can continue your communication with him. I don't think he'll be able to do the accents as well on email as he can in, uh, in reality. Right. And no, no animals were harmed in the making of that slideshow. <laughs> I have lots of questions that I want to ask, but I'll ask those offline as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's let's proceed to the the next uh, the next section. Uh, I don't want to cut short the people uh, on the on the panel. Uh, so uh, we uh, uh, we'll go straight to, we'll go straight to that. We've uh, asked the uh, the panelists to. Um, stick to a five minute uh, time frame and uh, they were responding to a prompt, uh, a couple of prompts. Are there particular situations where, uh, in your clinical practice where you find arts and humanities uh, uh, knowledge and skills have been helpful? And also are there such situations in which uh, you find that's been a challenge? So we'll start with uh, uh, Jephtha Davenport, uh, and maybe uh, I, I did mention this earlier, if I could get to each of the panelists as you start your bit to introduce yourselves. Thank you. Go ahead, Jephtha. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, my name is Jephtha Davenport, and I'm a neurologist uh, here in Calgary. Um, I did my internship, I think, 21 years later than Dr. Bloom, also at the Royal Victoria in Montreal, so we share that little bit of history. And I think someone's already mentioned that they've turned the rural Victoria into apartments and residences or something else, so I guess time moves on. Um, but the Montreal Neurological Hospital is still there and I, I did uh, training to become a neurologist and um, I've also worked in Toronto before coming to Calgary. Um, uh, just just in, a, in way of explaining why health humanities are important to me um, and why I think they're important to you. The, um, w one of the first classes in medical school I had where I remember people cheering uh, about something was when, when we were presented with a list of symptoms and someone figured out that the patient in the scenario likely had meningitis and the, whoever was teaching us asked, well, what does this person have? And someone said meningitis and, and the, the class erupted in cheers because someone got the, the, the correct answer. And um, I only realized a lot later that's really just the beginning of, of trying, to, trying to help people. Of course, we'd like to know what someone has. Um, and we spend a lot of time learning 
information that will help us try to understand what about a particular person might represent disease or illness or something that's wrong. And um, it's always a little dangerous paraphrasing Osler, but he said something to the effect that, you know, don't, don't worry so much about what disease a person has, worry more about what person has a disease. And just as Dr. Bloom was sharing with you, if, um, if you know who someone is, you'll probably go a lot further in helping them, uh, even without necessarily figuring out disease. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't try and try and answer the questions that people have. And, and as physicians, we, we do spend a lot of time diagnosing, but I think that um, if you diagnose someone and don't know who they are, you won't really be able to help them any way near as much as if you know who they are. Um, if there are uh, if there are any particulars about about myself that might be relevant uh, with the Healthy Humanities, I have spent some time um, after after finishing medical school and residency uh, studying Healthy Humanities as well. And human experience is so rich and and full of experience that. Uh, I feel really lucky to be able to meet people every day, almost every day, or at least every day that I'm working in the hospitals or clinics or, or, or visiting with people. And the more, the more you feel connected with other people, I think the easier it will be to try to, to put yourself in their shoes and understand what it is that they might be going through. And that's really one of the most important things in, in the helping people as a physician is trying to, trying to understand who they are and where they come from, where they're going, and what they're trying, what they're trying to do in life. Maybe I'll stop there and let one of the other panelists go away. I don't want to, don't want to exceed my time limit. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the uh, the other uh, rule uh, that we're uh, that we're using for the morning is we're going to get give each of the panelists their their five minutes, and then. Uh, uh, open things for questions and discussion. Uh, in the meantime, however, uh, as, uh, as uh, each of them is speaking, uh, feel free to uh, respond with, uh, with chats and we'll gather that uh, information up as well as we uh, get to the end. Uh, so next we've got uh, Laurie Pirelles. Okay, thanks. I'm Laurie Pirelles. <clears throat> I'm a family physician and um, I came from a, an arts background, uh, did my undergraduate training in arts, and I didn't, I had to actually pick up a few uh, science courses to get into medical school. So for me, you know, I've always been, humanities has always been a part of my understanding. <clears throat> now, at the present time in communications, you're learning how to take a history, and that's very important, and there's a, a fair bit of emphasis on uh, making the correct diagnosis, getting the history so you can make a diagnosis. And, and I think that obviously that's important because that was, that's what distinguishes us as physicians. But once you've mastered that, I would suggest you look at uh, narrative medicine, which is this particular interest of mine. And what it asks you to do is when somebody tells a story, to step back and move, move beyond the content and look at the process. So you say to yourself, well, what's the theme of this story that this patient is telling me? What is the plot? And in some plots, when patients tell you stories, they're, um, they're the hero of the story. And other times, more commonly sometimes, they're the victim. And then you have to look at that and take that information into, okay, this person sees themselves as a victim, and how am I going to adjust my uh, my, <clears throat> my treatment around that? And then, as Dr. Bloom said, it's very important to look at the language. And you learn that in psychiatry, that if you can mirror the language that the patient is used and use the same kind of language, then you develop a much better rapport. And then looking at the metaphors that they use. What kind of metaphors? How do they understand themselves? How are they explaining it? Now, you don't, occasionally you'll find that patients have tell totally chaotic stories. And rather than being frustrated with that, you have to say, this is a chaotic story. So that person has no concept of what's happening in their life and what's happening in their illness. And I think that can be very important. When, rather than getting upset about it, saying, okay, so this is a chaotic story, so how do I unravel that? And then listening for what's not said. And this can be very important, uh, particularly when you're 
when you've worked up a patient and you try to figure out what's wrong with them and there doesn't seem to be any answer. And a common example of that would be, say, uh, somebody presenting with pelvic pain or dyspareunia, and you've looked into every possibility and everything seems to be normal. So then you have to step back and say to them, ask that question, have you been sexually abused? And you'd be surprised how many people have had those kinds of encounters. Now, they may or may not tell you, even if they have been, but you've asked the question, so it may come up later. And if they do answer, then you have to step back and listen to that story and listen to think, how can I help this person now, now that they've shared that with me? So there's a lot of important uh, episodes in, in your medical career where you'll be able to use to the narrative approach to solving some of the problems. Okay, I think that's all I wanna say now. You wanna give me five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all of my colleagues, uh, all of my colleagues have always pushed back on having uh, been given only five minutes. You will probably find throughout medical school that uh, whenever we uh, restrict the time that our colleagues uh, get to, to talk in any uh, sessions, that what they do is they talk faster rather than uh, <laughs> talking, talking less. I'm, I'm particularly guilty of that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next person on the list is Mary Wallace, whom you met in session one. Mary. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everybody. I hope I don't uh, fit the description that Tom just gave. And I hope I stay within my time. Um, I am um, a clinical nurse specialist or an advanced practice nurse in palliative care, work on the consult service uh, here in Calgary. And um, being a nurse, my background is from the very beginning um, more holistic, I would say, in my assessment of patients. There is an intentional emphasis in nursing education and particularly in graduate education on the philosophical and theoretical underpinnings of what we're trying to achieve with our, our patients. And perhaps a more expanded view of the relationship that we have with patients that in includes intentionally the humanistic, the spiritual, anthropological uh, perspectives and so on. In addition, I happen to have, um, uh, I left nursing for quite a long time and did a PhD in English literature and uh, the literature of the Middle Ages. <clears throat> so I'm a hopeless case uh, in terms of humanity's mindedness. Uh, so that's kind of where my commitment to this whole endeavor comes from. I would like to focus my remarks um, today, and I, if I go over a little bit, I'll, somebody please signal to me and I'll, I'll defer the rest. But I want to just pick up on a comment that was made last week, and I think it was Travis who was talking about empathy and very eloquently described some of the challenges that he has with empathy. And I have a lot to say about empathy, and not all of it's good but I'll just restrict my comments to one central idea, and that is that empathy is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. It is one way of connecting with patients, but if it's problematic for people, why, there are other ways that it can be, that connection can be achieved. And the point is, the, the goal of it is not empathy, but a therapeutic alliance. That's a term you may come up come upon in the future. The, the goal is a sound, productive, therapeutic alliance with your patient in which the patient not only trusts you, but also feels understood uh, by you, or at least that you are trying to understand that person, that their suffering is recognized, and that your presence is comforting. That's the, that's the key. There is nothing more meaningful and powerful in a patient's experience than the sense that um, I am understood, that someone has grasped my pain or grasped who I am or what, my, what my, my difficulty is or my challenge is. So does the patient feel comforted by that? Yes, it's an old fashioned word, it's almost grandmotherly, but I think to feel that there's a comforting connection with your patient is, is really the essence of what we're doing. So I wanna give um, in brief an example from my own clinical practice that shows how the humanities can help with this. I had a patient who lived in the basement of a house that was uh, owned by her caregiver. Both were marginalized people. Her name was Suzanne. She was um, 
had a long history of schizophrenia. And I was involved with her because she had metastatic breast cancer in the end stages. Her caregiver was Jake, and um, he was struggling to care for her because he had a number of um, socioeconomic challenges. I'm not sure Jake could read because he um, had difficulty understanding the medication bottles and what was written there. The palliative home care nurse asked me to see this patient because we have to get her to hospice. That was the, the, my agenda that was given to me. So I was a little dubious about uh, going in with such a forceful agenda, but um, I spoke to Jake and I did examine uh, Suzanne in the basement and she was very, very ill and close to dying and it was portending to be a fairly uncomfortable death. I was afraid. So I talked quite candidly with Jake. I already knew this, this pair from before and we had had some conversations about dying, but Jake wasn't yet prepared to confront this. Um, in the course of the conversation though, he said to me at one point with a very startled look on his face, do you mean she's really dying? And I said, yes, I do. And he said in a, a burst of emotion, well, what the hell's the point of living if all you do is suffer and die? So stop there. There's three ways of responding to that comment. The first is simply to not hear it because it's the unanswerable question. And in our health professions, we're very used to giving information. And if we can fix something or we can answer a question, then the question exists. But the question doesn't exist if we can't intervene with it in some way. We're pretty uncomfortable with the unanswerables. So you will see this happen many times that those very poignant statements that are made by patients are not even heard or heard and dismissed. The second approach would be to make this clinical. This is caregiving coping. He's not a good coper. He's not coping well with this. And we might, with some de degree of success or not, intervene to help him cope. It may work, it may not, but we're still on our agenda and we're still labeling him with clinical um, nomenclature. The third approach is a more humanistically informed one, which says, hmm, that's a very electrifying statement. And I wish uh, Alan Bloom had been able to draw a picture of Jake's face when he was saying these words to me. It would have been very eloquent. That's very interesting. And if you have a humanities awareness, you may say to yourself, hmm, that's interesting. Where have I heard that before? That kind of comment. Well, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you may have read about it in the book of Job. Why is this happening to me? You may have read the book of Lamentations same thing. You may have studied Macbeth in high school and there's Macbeth saying life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. All these writers from the past have articulated what Jake in that moment is saying to me. He is that mouthpiece. He's the person that he is. It's his experience that all these other writers are talking about. And so you can see Jake a little differently now because he's uttering something that's profoundly true, not only for him and for everybody else, but for me too. I have a problem with understanding this. And that's the point of empathy. That's where you can start to connect with the problem that we all share. And I've thought a lot about this encounter since that time. So I, I wouldn't say it was out of extreme wisdom that I said what I said to him both. But these thoughts have started to run through my mind as, as Jake said this. So he said to me, what the hell's the point of living if all you do is suffer and die? And I paused and I said, you hit the nail on the head, buddy. You just asked the $64 million question. And he looked back at me and we both sort of got it, that this was the unanswerable problem that we both kind of understood in that moment. And we talked a little bit more about how tough it is and how there are unanswerables and we connected. And I really feel that it was that moment of understanding that allowed the rest of the interaction to go the way it did, which was Jake started talking about, well, maybe we should send Suzanne to hospice. But it was in making that 
profound emotional connection with a lived reality for both of us. And just sharing that, taking the time to do that. I had other patients to see. This was getting to be a long conversation, but it was worth every second because the outcome unfolded on its own once the, the connection had been made. I didn't do it particularly through empathy, but I did it through that other more universal type of connection. Also, I just want to comment that this is not a technique. It's a way of being with patients and being with yourself and reflecting on things as you, as you hear them. And that generates the response uh, that you have to a patient. So it's, it's, um, it requires some creativity and some alertness and listening and, and cognitive processing in the moment to identify the response that, that most speaks to the moment. But it's not a technique. It's not that, oh, isn't this neat? Jake reminds me of the book of Job. No, no. It's just having those thoughts alive in the background. They will inform your response. That's all for me for now. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I hope everybody's getting uh, a strong sense of how many different ways there are of uh, looking at, uh, at uh, this issue. Uh, next, we have uh, Stephanie Plamondon. Hello everyone. Um, so for my background, I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, also known as physiatry or PM&R. And when I was in first year, I had no idea about that specialty or anything about it. So I don't know if anyone in the crowd uh, here has heard of it, but I thought I'd just take that opportunity to share with you what it is. Um, so physiatrists are neurological and musculoskeletal experts who treat injury or illness non-surgically to decrease pain or restore maximum function. So common patient groups that we often um, care for are brain injury patients, stroke, cancer rehab, a spinal cord injury, amputation, and in my case, neuromuscular disease like ALS and um, muscular dystrophies. So we, we consider ourselves a specialty that focuses on um, activity, participation, and quality of life. And we feel we are health advocates for those with functionally disabling conditions. So, um, why am I interested in humanities as a physician? I think one of the reasons may be that in my practice, I've had the privilege to walk with patients very intimately through the stories of their journeys of recovery from life-changing illnesses and injuries or um, in their progressive decline over time in the case of progressive neurological diseases like ALS. Um, another reason though is probably often what drives people to become passionate about something and that's experiencing someone that they care about in their own lives, um, going through the healthcare system, a parent, a sibling, or a child perhaps. In my case, um, I've been very interested in music and I think never has the power of music to heal been more obvious than during this pandemic. Um, in many major international disasters, our early human response is often to seek, give comfort or mobilize our resilience through music and you just have to look at all the images of Italians and Spanish uh, people singing for strength on their balconies. And even in Canada, the Stronger Together Canada COVID-19 um, April broadcast benefit was the largest single show broadcast in Canadian history and the highest uh, viewed non-sporting broadcast in Canadian television history, raising $6 million for Food Banks Canada. But on a smaller scale, patients that are sick enough to be in the ICU and those with neurological disease and palliative patients that are experiencing their own life-changing personal disasters, necessitating our comfort and the need to create a feeling of safety in the hospital or in the clinics. I think music helps to really achieve this and the opportunities to use music for healing should be woven throughout healthcare. And there's quite a lot of emerging evidence in this field. So I wanted to share some feedback um, from the music therapy program that's going on at the foothills that I've been able to be a part of bringing to the foothills from a, a nurse that works on the acute spine unit. So she wrote to me in an email to say thank you and hope that it continues because it's by donation at this point, but um, she gave specific examples. She says, uh, we have had patients touched in every stage of injury in life from palliative tumors to simple procedures where nothing else is working for pain, to new spinal cord injuries that need to work on upper extremity strength or just need a break from the worries of what life is going to look like going forward, our music therapist has been able to help them all. 
Last Christmas, we had a patient who was struggling with the end of life process. We consulted Jesse, hoping that it would bring him some distraction or joy, but it really brought so much more. Jesse helped this man write a legacy song to process, process through his grief and leave a piece of himself for his family when he moved on. It was beautiful and brought so much healing to a man who had been through so much pain and suffering in his cancer journey. Earlier this year, we had a young man who became a quadriplegic in a traumatic accident, and our music therapist worked alongside our allied health team to strengthen his upper extremities to the fullest of his abilities using his musical skills and interests as a launching board. Around the same time, she helped another young man remember that as much as his life had changed by becoming a paraplegic, music was still something that he could turn to for an escape from the struggles or for a bit of peace. She not only, only positively affected every patient she has come in contact with, she has changed the way us as staff approach patients as well. She reminds us that in a very real way, how modern medicine is not always the best treatment and a little bit of complementary therapy can go a very long way. She boosts morale, she creates a beautiful atmosphere when she is on the unit. So music changes the culture of the hospital or the outpatient clinic or wherever it is. Um, and she says, I don't speak for my, just myself when I say that music therapy is my favorite day to be at work. It truly makes a difference. So just to, to leave with you that thought that um, think about music in your own life and how it is helpful for your own wellness um, and mental health and how it can be used in the healthcare settings um, to create connections and sometimes nonverbal connections with patients that have trouble communicating. Um, and and create that positive culture and environment. And that's all I had to say. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, next, Wayne Rosen. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, and I just want to say to Dr. Bloom, I really enjoyed your presentation. What a lovely uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, my name is Wayne Rosen. I'm a general surgeon at the Peter Lougheed, and um, you know, one of the classic stereotypes about uh, surgeons is that they're the antithesis of humanities. Um, but there is, in fact, a, a long tradition of humanities in uh, surgery and some really wonderful uh, writers, uh, Richard Seltzer, who I'm sure Dr. Bloom is familiar with, uh, some really great uh, 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 writers. Um, my background really was in the humanities to begin with. I spent the first six years of my post-secondary school uh, in philosophy and German literature and um, uh, and planned on actually going into that as a long-term career um, and then somewhere near the end of that uh, I just realized that um, I didn't think I was going to be uh, satisfied and um, uh, that I'd need something more engaging more practical in my life and um, uh, and so I went into medicine and then ultimately went into surgery and, um, uh, but what I realize is that I've had this cloud of humanities around me for most of my career, which I, I don't notice because it's what I breathe and, and live in. And so it's, I'm hard pressed to say how it influences what I do because um, it is, I think, who one is. And I don't think we all have to have the same quote unquote humanities. I think um, it is a way of being, as Mary said about, um, how we, uh, uh, how we engage with people and um, how we listen to their stories and how we um, uh, uh, respect their, uh, their lives. Um, I have many patients who come to see me over many, many years or return after five or 10 years and um, they look vaguely familiar and I look in their chart and it's very thick and I see that they, um, they had a, a month long stay in the hospital under my care and I did you know, three operations on them and, uh, and then eventually they got out of the ICU where Dr. Rosenall took care of them for a while and then they, they went home and, and they got better and they haven't come to see me for five or seven years. And I can hardly remember that experience. And what's very funny or very interesting is they can hardly remember it as well. They don't remember what operations I did or um, how I treated them or th what the treatment was but they always remember how I treated them. Uh, they always say, you know, I, I just wanted to come back and see you because um, uh, uh, I don't actually know what you did anymore, but I know that you treated me well. And so I guess um, that would be the only 
real uh, uh, aspect, I guess, of, of humanities in that it, uh, I think, um, provides a space to listen to patients and to, um, uh, 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 to uh, allow them to, uh, I guess, understand a little bit about you as well uh, and the way you treat them. So there's some, um, I made a couple of notes here, but I don't have much more uh, to say other than that. Um, um, I, I am a little bit wary that sometimes we, we see the humanities a little bit like um, uh, 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 another course in that you need to be inoculated, uh, get your vaccine and you'll be suddenly, uh, uh, you'll have this special skill. And it's not really like that. Uh, as I, I think everyone on this panel has made clear that we have different ways of, of being human and of uh, conveying our, uh, you know, or listening to the humanities uh, that uh, engage with uh, uh, patients, music, writing, etc. And so uh, I don't think you should feel pressured to be, uh, uh, do the humanities in one way or another, but simply to be open and listening um, and uh, you will all be uh, 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 rewarded for that. That's all I have to say, uh, Tom. Thanks so much, Wayne. Uh, I think that was a great way of, uh, uh, making a, a circle out of uh, uh, the various things that uh, people were, were saying. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, we've had uh, one comment come up on the, uh, on the chat screen. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, uh, read that out. I think all of you will, will see it as well. Uh, hearing from Mary, it makes me realize how much the process of re reflexivity is needed throughout our training especially to pause, reflect, and change our ways of being and caring. I think that really resonates with some, a number of things that some of you have said. Uh, how can trainees like ourselves dedicate time for this? Is this supported through our courses such as medical skills? And that's coming from Tharsini. Uh, and that's the sort of question that I'd like to throw out uh, to uh, each of you on the panel. Uh, each of you has been involved in medical skills uh, and several of the other courses and many of the other courses at the medical school and I'm, I'm curious uh, how you would how you would answer this with regard to both the, the time allowed as well as the nur nurturing of, uh, of uh, such uh, such things as reflexivity um, I'll or, Oh, sorry, Mary and then Wayne? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. I, I'm thinking, um, I, d I doubt that it is specifically supported through courses in medical skills because it's not a skill. Um, in a way it is, but it's a habit of thinking um, that one cultivates over time. So to go to the previous question, how can trainees like ourselves dedicate time for this? Uh, two ways. Um, I really admire Dr. Bloom for his discipline in writing and thinking about his patients and reflecting on their predicaments um, at the time that he saw them, even through medical school. When he started at McGill. I think that's really admirable. It's not something I ever did or was, no one ever suggested that I do it, but if I had to live my professional career over, I would start um, writing little vignettes and little commentaries on how various patients affected me. Um, the other way is to read um, look at art, go to movies, and think about the things that you see. And um, it's better to read a book rather than online because you can mark it up and interact with it in the margins. So lots and lots of exposure in your uh, non-clinical time to uh, literature or arts that push you to consider the larger universal questions. I think that's a very helpful way of doing it, but I, I cannot stress enough <laughs> in retrospect, how I've discovered the value of writing about patients that I've seen and their effect on me. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Wayne? Um, so I should speak up as the chair of the medical skills course here at the uh, uh, University of Calgary Coming School of I, I Medicine. Didn't, I didn't want to put you on the spot about that, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, but Mary actually really touched on this already, and um, and I would say first you're going to get an introduction to uh, uh, medical skills on Wednesday this after uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, uh, but medical skills is a bit of a misnomer, or, or I shouldn't say it's not a misnomer. It, it's quite correct in most 
universities, the, the course is called clinical skills. And that's the course where you learn to take a history from patients, you learn to do a physical exam, and, um, and that's the primary part of it. In Calgary, we, we call it medical skills because it does include a number of other skills such as um, uh, professionalism, uh, 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 medical ethics, um, or ethical evaluation skills, and um, uh, appreciation of some of the global health skills, et cetera. And it, it's not really a humanities-based course, but I would say there are many touch points for, for pursuing humanities from it. And certainly uh, in the area of global health, uh, uh, bioethics, um, professionalism, and self-care, uh, those are all areas. Um, and several of the people here on this committee have, uh, or on this uh, panel, have actually taught in the course and I think would attest to that. So I would simply say that it's not really gonna be a, a fundamental aspect of the medical skills uh, course, but it will be, uh, uh, you'll have an opportunity to take uh, 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 a start there at least for it. Um, Tom, um, I think that you can supplement it. I mean, you, I think it's overwhelming being a, a first year medical student in terms of what's expected and the amount of work. And sometimes, you know, to add other things just seems too much. But I think um, you can, we, I have used journals in, uh, in medical skills where people have written down, you know, with, with prompts, uh, things that have bothered them or how they felt about things, and then we could talk about it later. Also, if you, if you want to, you could be, belong to a journal club or a book club where you get an opportunity to, you know, select reading and talk about things outside of, of medicine, but related to medicine. I think those are good ways to sort of supplement the, the basic medical skills as you would think of them. Maybe if I could just interject as well, if you wanted to dig more deeply into some of these topics, we'll also uh, have an opportunity to, to discuss some ways of doing that at session three. This is a plug for, for session three uh, of some, uh, some uh, supplementary uh, work uh, that the Health Humanities Group has been able to put together, like having a writer in residence. Uh, uh, available uh, to medical students uh, and, and so on. I, I was going to um, <clears throat> go back to something that Stephanie mentioned about uh, the way in which music uh, changes the the culture of the unit. I think you had something in, in an email from one of your colleagues uh, with regard to that. And the way, and the reason I mentioned that is the way in which what we do and the way that we are, as some of you have said, uh, is partly a social process. It's not just it's not just what's happening inside our own heads, but also uh, something that we share with the people that we work together with. And as as you probably all know already, uh, a lot of healthcare is delivered uh, in team fashion. So how does the team do this? Uh, 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 develop the kind of uh, relationships with patients, develop an environment in which patients feel listened to and respected. Uh, I'm wondering if, if any of you could, uh, could comment on the way that uh, uh, we could help that, uh, that group process along and your experiences uh, with how that's uh, happened at, at the school. for any of the panelists. <laughs> Tom, I think that's a bit of a challenge because, you know, the students sort of rotate in and out of established teams. And I, I think you see more <laughs> teamwork when you get out into practice where you have a, an established team and you develop relationships and you come to trust each other and then you really, you know, try to focus. You know, because our focus is uh, patient patient-centered care. And then you really see the team, you know, work together and make it happen. But I think it's a real challenge in medical school where in some ways the medical students as they rotate through feel like they're almost like a fifth wheel. I don't know. That sounds like something that we should perhaps work on then. Well, I, I might chip in. 
although I'm not on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> you're, but you're more than welcome to do that, as, as well as any of the uh, students. Some of you will probably have had some experience uh, in, out in the field there. Go ahead, Martina. I guess that one of, this, one of the things you'll be coming up to is MED 330, and one of the specific objectives we ask you for during those family medicine placements is actually to reflect on um, your experiences as part of the team. And we'll be talking about a thing called a patient medical home, which is where family doctors and all, all doctors actually uh, work together. So it may not be absolutely overt, um, but I think as if you like even flies on the wall or having half days in clinic, you have good opportunities to reflect on teamwork. Um, and then hopefully as you get through medical school, you'll get more exposure to it. And I think we're always reflecting. It's sort of, like Mary said, it's just a habit of mind. So I think there are opportunities. They mightn't be in your face, but they're there. Maybe it's Mary. the stuff that's not in your face that's, uh, <laughs> that's often the most fun. Mary? Did, sorry, oh, did I was you... I just going to make the comment that one of the, the great values that I've seen with being on... Um, multi-professional, I'm, I'm not sure what the latest buzzword, I think it's interprofessional team where everybody brings a different perspective, is it very quickly reminds you that you're not the only game in town. And that's very helpful because it takes the burden off you having to fix everything, but it also um, broadens you outside of the bounds of your own discipline. Because, you know, a way of seeing, this was in the article that Tom distributed before, I was caught by this phrase, a way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. So your way of looking at the world from, in my case, a nursing perspective, is also a way of not seeing other things that are out there. And the great wonder and joy of a team is listening to all of those different uh, perspectives and also reading some of the right some of the uh, literature from those other disciplines really gives you an insight uh, and uh, provides a, a more holistic view um, not sure that answers your question Tom but something I felt I well, I, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you raised the issue of interdisciplinarity because the the other disciplines do look at uh, at what they I mean we all we all have different lenses uh, for all sorts of reasons, either because we see patients for different reasons or we see them in different environments and so on. And uh, it, multiple perspectives is one of the uh, gifts that the arts and humanities brings to, to medicine. Uh, and to, uh, that's, that's definitely one way of, you know, we've, we've talked about listening to patients, uh, but uh, I, in my, in my own case, I'm also not a member of the panel, so maybe I shouldn't be saying this, <laughs> but in my own case, listening to my colleagues is, uh, is just as important as, uh, as listening to my patients. And it often helps me hear my patients if I hear them through the ears of my colleagues, if I can say it in that semi-metaphorical sort of, sort of way. Uh, along, sorry, Wayne? Did you? I was just I was just going to add that one of the units of the med skills course is something called collaborative practice, and that's really about the interdisciplinary nature and of uh, medicine and the and the fact that uh, uh, you really can't function in medicine without that sort of um, uh, interdisciplinary interprofessional relationships. You're going they're all going to be showing the movie Greg's Story uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, um, that really highlights this. And then they get a couple of interesting simulation experiences over the course of the next year, where you'll, you'll sort of appreciate the, the real uh, diversity and uh, significance of many of the uh, interdisciplinary components of medicine. Along the interdisciplinary uh, line as well, there is a, a question for Mary that uh, came from from one of the students uh, with regard to uh, whether your uh, Mary whether your uh, humanities background and your experience specifically with palliative care gives you a particular view or approach to uh, to uh, to patients. Yeah, I think it it does. Um, some of it I cultivate and some of it just kind of sits there. Um, one of the things uh, um, that the humanities background gives you, I studied 
wisdom dialogues in the Middle Ages, if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, and so it, it, it was an exploration of how we talk to each other in a helping way. There are so many other ways to do it than the models that conventional um, psychology uh, presents. And um, I became uh, aware of how important it is to be comfortable at the margin of knowledge so that uh, because that's where a lot of our dying patients are in particular it's where science meets the mystery because at a certain point you die and we have no clue what that is about or what happens afterwards there may be some faith-based suppositions that are made but at the end of the day um, the the knowledge world that we're all so familiar with and so enamored of the scientific universe that's brought us so far intellectually, it does break down at a certain point. And it's important to be comfortable at that margin. And a lot of my uh, work in medieval study necessarily uh, is theology. And just looking at those spiritual perspectives about what is known and what is not known and where we locate ourselves in that spectrum uh, was very helpful to me. Um, so when it came to working with uh, patients in palliative care, uh, that's, I, I had to work at finding comfort at that marginal level, which is so crucially important for people who are the ones who are dying because there's no going back. It is the absolute, it's the absolute that, that presents your, itself to you. And so there's a certain amount of uh, self-care work that needs to happen. Um, so that you can find um, uh, within yourself the capacity to receive and understand what people are telling you from that margin, what that's like for them. And if we're not comfortable with that ourselves, with being in that mystery area, why um, it doesn't work so well. You, we can't connect as well. So um, yes, the answer is yes, it, it has affected me a lot, but, but not... I wouldn't say from a lot of academic, uh, you know, cognitive writing. It's just a, something that Im imbues you with repeated exposure to big ideas, well expressed through art, through the humanities, uh, listening to patients, all the in incredible things that people will say to you, um, sensitizes you to the importance of that time at the end of life and why, uh, why it's so important to be there to support people. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that's come up is uh, related to uh, the uh, role of patients' uh, background culture and how that has an impact on the way in which we interact with them, develop relationships with them, uh, and, and so on. Uh, any of the panelists want to take that on, especially given uh, the, the, uh, uh, the various difficult problems that, are, uh, that have been there for a long time, but that are coming to the fore with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, and uh, many, many other social disruptions occurring as we, as we speak. Yeah, I think I think that's an important issue. We often feel more comfortable with people who seem similar to us, who have similar values or similar culture or, or beliefs that we we share. And I think it's a real challenge then when you have patients who have totally different uh, world views. And sometimes that can be very helpful. Uh, I find the humanities in terms. I was reading uh, recently a poet called Carr. She's a young poet, and she written a book called uh, You Ask Me Where I'm Going. And she really sort of gets inside what it would be like to be in her skin as someone with, um, uh, I think she's, um, she's a Sikh. She has a Sikh background, and she's also of color. And she talks a lot about, you know, being subjected to the male gaze and also what it's like how people look at her skin first. And what's that, what that's like. So I think the humanities, because we can't, we don't know what it's like to be inside of somebody else's skin. But I think reading other people's experiences can be very helpful. And these poems are really quite short, but very poignant. 
So it's not like you have to read an entire volume. You can, there are different ways of accessing that. And then just asking people, well, what is it like for you? You say, I don't, I don't know. Uh, what is it like for you? And I think that is sort of an opening question for people. I think um, the other benefit of bringing music into healthcare is that you can, it, it is very um, culturally useful in many, um, you know, it's very important to many different cultures. And uh, an example I can think of um, would be that there's actually an Indigenous music therapist who works in Edmonton that I've come across and um, it's been very useful and helpful for her to be available to patients um, to help the team connect um, with the, uh, an Indigenous patient or family and make them feel comfortable, reduce their anxiety, bring, bring that culture into the hospital to help them manage things and music is a very quick way to be able to do that and there's you know if, if your team can bring in um, uh, any different type of culture different type of background music like um, if, uh, if people from an um, uh, East Indian culture or a Chinese culture feel more less anxious with hearing some of their own cultural music that can really help um, to reduce their anxiety in hospital situations etc so I think music is is one tool that is very adaptable to, to various cultures as well that help people. It's one of the, uh, one of the great uh, leveling forces in the world, isn't it, music? Yes, requires less translation for some than, than some of our other techniques. It's a great point, thank you. We're uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of our to the end of our time here. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Alan Bloom is still on the call. I don't see his image there. Uh, He's here, Tom. Uh, uh, he is there. Okay, great. Uh, was uh, so if uh, folks have any uh, questions for him, him, there he is. Hi. Thanks for uh, sending us those. Uh, those references on the, on the chat box. Uh, I, I don't recall seeing something from you, Alan, about your uh, work on smoking as well. You mentioned your, your work on disability and so on. But if, if anyone wants to know anything about uh, the role of tobacco in healthcare, Alan's your, Alan's your man. Well, I, that was an issue that I, I chose. Uh, in medical school because I assumed that the number one preventable cause of death and disease would be covered heavily, but it never was. Uh, and I got a 30 minute talk by Dr. Brigitte Namias on occupational disability in which she juxtaposed her patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease next to the macho men in the advertisements. And uh, I took it from there and uh, created a group called DOC or Doctors Ought to Care. And we now have, uh, you know, over 25 years, we sort of sparked a lot of the activism and we helped initiate Physicians for Smoke-Free Canada. So um, I'm sort of history. I'll send you the website for that. I'd love to get some feedback on that. You know, now I just read a piece yesterday about COVID and, and smoking. And, and the problem with academia is that, um, uh, people get into their scholarly niches and they, they guard the, it like a silo or, and they guard their turf. And someone actually wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association that uh, COVID may only kill 200,000 and smoking still kills 480,000 Americans a year. And that's a horrible comparison. Um, none of us, I don't think, um, expect to get a virus. Um, and um, there is a certain uh, aspect to smoking that's an industrial promoted condition. But it, it does make for compelling uh, uh, arguments about uh, how we're going to get rid of pandemics. I was joking with Tom earlier today that uh, President Trump has commuted the virus uh, because he's, he's basically going, taking us back to about the 14th century um, in, in not wearing masks and doing the simplest things that we know to prevent uh, disease. And this is what the United States did for decades by being in cahoots with the tobacco industry. So there is a certain comparison. 
of not wanting to really address an issue or flatten the curve. It's taken us 50 years to flatten the curve on smoking. Just want to shout out to Wayne because I see he's got a box of tissues in his in his office, and I, to me that's a very essential item for surgeons. Um, I hope it's not just allergies. Um, and I, I want to thank Mary too for uh, her, her analogies, and also uh, Jeff for uh, some of his thoughts on the importance of the humanities in the neurosciences and. Uh, um, just a, a great panel, and also uh, to our colleague in, 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 in physiatry, where I sort of got my start, and to uh, Raleigh for her work too. Tom, I, I just had a, a quote from Dr. Anthony Fauci that I thought might be useful to share at the end, um, having talked about the US and the pandemic. Um, I read an article where he was quoted from the National Geographic in May of this year. He said his entire training is steeped in the humanities. And when you combine that with an aptitude for science, you wind up being a physician. Wow. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, I, I'm, I'm trained as a pulmonary physician, even though I, I spent most of my career in critical care medicine. So, so his, uh, his work, especially his work in AIDS and so on, is really something that I've admired in the past. It's nice to know that he, uh, he said something good about humanities as well. That's great. Thanks. Tom? Thanks, Stephanie. Tom? Yes, Wayne? I have a question for you. Um, I, I knew you when you were a, a practicing critical care physician. Uh, were you always interested in the humanities? Did it change when you, when you gave up? Or what, what brought you to the uh, uh, medical humanities? So thank you for, uh, this gives me an opening for my standard joke. I have some standard jokes about uh, surgeons, but I won't get into those because you've already, you've already mentioned that. Uh, so my standard joke is that uh, in critical care, when I was faced with a patient who wanted to tell me their story, my approach was to get a vial of midazolam and a vial of fentanyl, make them comatose and put a tube down their throat, and then get their story from their family. So I, in a way, I'm paying penance for that approach. The fact of the matter is that uh, I think I've uh, always been a little bit like you, even though none of my university work was in arts or humanities, uh, but that my way of being was very much related to a lot of arts and humanities uh, interests that I had. And I think I've always viewed uh, my healthcare experiences through that lens. One of my most uh, compelling experiences as a clinical clerk was doing uh, a rotation on psychiatry uh, where the, uh, uh, the psychiatrist I was working with uh, heard uh, a very sad story from a, a patient who had uh, acute schizophrenia, but had recovered well enough to be able to describe what had happened to him. And the psychiatrist leaned forward and said, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And so going, going back to, uh, to Mary's comment about, uh, about Macbeth, I had never heard a physician quote Macbeth or quote Shakespeare at all. Uh, when discussing something with a patient, and in a way it crystallized what I felt was this patient's story. And that's, that's, my, that's my story. Thanks for, thanks for asking. You know, I, can I add a couple of points? Because Tom and I went in different directions. We both graduated the same year, and I, I went from internal medicine into family medicine, which I felt was more uh, patient focused as opposed to disease focused. Um, but I, I think this is so remarkable, this experience of, of being with you all, because this conjured up the grand rounds that we used to have, where on Saturday we, we would have all of the departments meet. I don't know if I've ever seen that uh, since, but um, this is as close as I've come to a grand rounds. And I'd like to ask Mary too, you know, nurses and physicians used to go on rounds together, uh, but they no longer do. Um, it's, it's just uh, truly th this, these separate uh, entities of subspecialties and different disciplines trying to uh, communicate with one another. And I don't think we're doing 
a very good job. I'll give Mary was, a that a, was that a question for me or? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I can't recall the last time I've spoken to nursing groups, but I, I, I just don't think we, we round together. We don't really talk. Uh, and so what do you, have, has your experience been that the, the professions have become disparate? No, actually the opposite um, because of uh, being in palliative care. And there we're so deeply embedded in each other's discipline. And we have rounds every week where we go through as a group, every single patient on the list. And um, the, the best that I can say, I think it's improving here. I, I don't know, Wayne can probably weigh in on that too. Uh, but I think there is more collaboration. And one of the things I do notice as palliative care becomes more current and people are, are accepting and aware of it and requesting it, um, I think that model is being um, seen for its true value in collaboration. So we're sort of role modeling collaboration when other um, specialties and subspecialties say, oh, look how they do. They have, they have rounds every week where everybody's there, the respiratory therapist, the nurse, the OT, the physician, the CNS, everybody's around. And I think people are starting to notice that that's, that's a pretty good way. I, I feel very spoiled that I have a, a team, you know, that, that's built into the team to, to function that way. So I think that, that that's yeah. a good, that's a good example. Another good example are the, the Tuesday uh, CPC conferences we have for patients with a cancer. So all of the specialties get together. I was more referring to the day-to-day -day rounds mm -hmm. Of, of the hospital rounds of internal medicine and family medicine where uh, we don't round with the nurses. Yeah, um, and that is something I don't know as much about uh, simply because I'm community-based, not acute care. So um, I don't know, maybe Wayne's better at answering that question than I am because uh, he's right in there in the hospital. I don't know how much exposure there is to other disciplines when you're doing rounds. Wayne, what do you think? Um, well, I certainly would have something to say, but I suspect Jephthah as well. Um, but the, the, when I started off in medicine, we used to have uh, uh, weekly rounds, but now we've all become very siloed in our specific areas. And so um, we go to our surgery rounds on, on Friday mornings, and then the nurses also have their nursing rounds and the uh, other specialties have their rounds. And so we don't have that sort of uh, uh, relationship anymore. And I, as you mentioned it, uh, Alan, I think it really does, it is something that we're missing, at least in, in some of the acute care hospitals. And I'd be curious to hear Jephthah's thought on this because you're also hospital-based. Yeah, Wayne, thank you. Um, it, it's true that, uh, that what you're saying, uh, Dr. Bloom, that, that sometimes we are, we're not mixing enough with all of our potential colleagues, uh, but uh, but when it does happen, it can be very rich and rewarding. And uh, probably ideally it'd be nice to even to round with patients, uh, at least on their own situations and really involve them in what's going on. And I, and I like that when it does happen, whether it's on a ward in a hospital or or if you have, if we're calling together meetings, I mean, sometimes they have to be arranged as special sort of one-off family meetings or, or this sort of thing. But the more you're able to bring in a community of people who are caring after uh, caring for an individual or, or a group of individuals, I think I think there's a lot of richness there that that it um, would know, be, be best not to miss out on. Just one more thing, you know, I had an experience where as chief resident in family medicine, as a LARC, I decided to invite the custodians and the nursing assistants and anybody who worked on the floor. Uh, the, the custodians were amazing. Uh, they, they, they really were talking to patients. They told us all sorts of things we had no idea, including uh, things about adherence to their medications and so forth and slipping out for a smoke. But uh, I think quite seriously, the other side of the coin is we can intimidate patients by standing over them. And I've seen too many people cry on rounds uh, to think that the, the group is really the best solution. So uh, there's got, bound to be a way. Um, I, I was in, uh, uh, Abu, uh, I guess it was uh, Dubai and had the chance to be a visiting uh, teacher and was very impressed. Many of the patients stayed on mats on the floor um, and we sort of got down and, and, and sat on the floor as well. Um, I really was shocked at, at how much I learned from working in a different country. 
Uh, so Jacqueline Allen, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear you talking about uh, learning from other environments. Uh, my own experience uh, is, uh, because I do a lot of things with the electronic health record, is uh, spending some time at a pediatric intensive care unit, which is normally way outside my realm of, uh, of expertise. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, involving families in rounds, the, pediat the pediatricians are way ahead of the rest of us. And I think we have a lot to learn from them about ways of doing that uh, in both. Uh, a, a, you know, it, it, it demonstrates respect for the families, for the parents in this case, uh, but could easily demonstrate that as well for, for patients and, uh, and involve them in ways perhaps that are sensitive to that notion that, that the patients in the bed and everybody else is standing up looking rather looking either grim or, uh, or aggressive. I just would relate a little anecdote that comes to mind in the 1980s when I was attending, of all places, in an ICU. I, I can't even imagine how I got through that month, but uh, uh, the resident was going on and on and on about the patient's electrolytes and every other lab value I'd ever heard of, and he seemed to know them pretty well, but I said to him, just, I, I, it, just a matter of fact, you know, so who, who is this person? And he looked at me like I was nuts. Uh, and he said, what are you talking about? He's critically ill. I said, yes, but, but who is he? Tell me more about him. And he was really annoyed. But the next morning, he came up to me and tugged on my shoulder and said, I, I got to tell you about this guy. He, was, he, he designed this hospital. He was an architect. And he couldn't stop talking about this, this uh, person with all the tubes. One little anecdote, too, was the, the, this is a shaggy dog story of the older psychiatrist and the younger psychiatrist coming up in the elevator each morning. Stop me if you've heard this, but um, they're all in their suits and ties and they go up in the elevator every morning, bright and bushy. And at the end of the day, the, they go back down in the elevator together and the young psychiatrist has his tie out, his hair is all tousled, he's absolutely exhausted. But the older psychiatrist looks as impeccable as the morning elevator ride. And finally, the younger guy can't stand it anymore. He says, I don't understand this. How can you do this? all day long listening to these stories and not be like that. He says, who listens? So with that, with that, with that counter example, I would like to thank all of the panelists and Dr. Bloom very much for, for their uh, wonderful uh, stories and insights, uh, insights today. Uh, just uh, a final plug for session three, we'll be talking about the relationship between all of the things we've been talking about for the last couple of days and your upcoming uh, course one, uh, Blood and Guts. And there will be lots of opportunities for further discussion at that time. Uh, I apologize to anyone uh, who uh, had some uh, questions and comments that I either didn't get to at all or that I, I, I realized I didn't completely uh, interpret some of them correctly. So my, apologize. I, my apologies for that. I hope you all have a safe uh, and uh, pleasant rest of your days. Thank you all.